of your um, vortices traffic and put it upside down um, off to the side so that you pick up the door. That's the last thing we'll do today. There will be independent activity. Um, you wouldn't know that. That will be the last thing um, that we'll do at the end of the day. Here's our learning target for today. We're going to try like to distinguish between the terms rule procedure and routine. I cover one in our kick out the door, and also number one on your previous panel. I can identify the most effective strategies for increasing the student growth. That's number two, one in the kick out the door. Identify the guiding principle for teaching and learning. That's number three, one in the kick out the door. Identify the components of the North Carolina Comprehensive Assessment Process. That's one of the questions on your pre-assessment. Pre and identify the guiding questions related to the North Carolina Instructional Framework. So I hope that you will do well on or by the end of this 45 minute session. Any questions on what we planned on? All right. First thing we're going to do is to determine uh, the difference between those three terms. The only, if you look at the definition of those three terms, they're about the same, but there's some things that distinguish the between the two, if you know about the work of Wong and Marzano. Can someone tell me something that, that makes one of them unique? Um, I thought that the rule was something that like students can't do, or procedure is something that students do with guidance, and then uh, routine is something that uh, they can do. Very good. So procedures, you're still giving them direction. They're not doing it automatically yet, you're still having to remind them. When you walk in, don't forget to pick up your phone book um, and begin on your, um, your opening activity, whatever that is. So that's a, a, that's a procedure. A routine happens automatically. A little bit different from the rule part. A rule is the only one that has a consequence that can lead to the opposite. A rule is the only one that has a consequence that can lead to an opposite result. So it's in terms of procedure routine, procedure, you're still reminding them, routine have, happen automatically. So if you write that down in your definition, on question number one, on your kick out the door, you're doing well. But don't do that yet. Don't do that yet. Just hand. That's the hand activity. So how many rules does Marlano and um, and Wong say you should have? Three to five is correct. As a, as a high school teacher, I typically only had two. My two rules were raise your hand and receive permission before talking, and raise your hand and receive permission before leaving your desk. I could run, I could run my classroom with those two rules. Um, I then had a procedure for proper word structure. So I loosened up that raise your hand and receive permission before talking, that procedure. But, but in, in terms of my rules, those were the two rules I had. When I got fifth grade, I had to add another uh, rule of keep your hands and feet to yourself. The little children love to touch each other. And so I needed that rule in addition to the two. Um, but I can manage in the elementary classroom very well with those two rules. My, my district usually had rules concerning um, use of cell phones and all those types of things, so I didn't have to have a classroom rule for that. So either my school had those rules or my district did. So I didn't repeat those in my classroom rules. Any questions about rules, procedures, or routines? Again, that's number one. There's actually one, two, three. That's one, two, three, four, five, that's six, sixty percent of your test comes to have a in the area. Remember on pre-assessment, um, there are only two grades, either an A or not yet. A majority of people on course not yet, just to let you know. Um, on, the, on the rest of the assessment, and this kick out the door will be a form of assessment, but on the rest of the assessment, you'll actually get a percentage. A hundred down from zero. Actually, if you get your name right, you'll get a percentage. If everything else is done. So you'll get an actual grade for everything that's been put out. And each of the kicks out the door, a formal assessment. We only have one summer of assessment. It'll be exactly the same as the pre assessment, but I'll change the word pre to form. How does that identity again? Remember today you should be able to answer questions number one, three, four, five, and six on that pre assessment. Yeah, I think you all have to make sense of that. Any questions so far? All right, let's go to the second activity. The very first worksheet you have is called the word wall activity. You're going to have two minutes 
Okay, all of those important things that we do in education on our board wall and identify the most important thing, put a one by it, in terms of establishing student growth. If we want to promote student growth in our students, and, and that's what I'm all about, student growth, what's the most important thing of all those things I have listed? And then put a two by the second most important all the way down to five. So identify the five most important things in terms of promoting student growth. So one, two, three, four, five, eight. We only have two minutes to do that. Two minutes to do that independently. One, two, three, four, five. But we're going to kick it up a notch by having you spar with someone, so your shoulder buddy, and agree upon the top five. So right now you have an independent five. You have to agree upon a common top five. Is there any way from a distance that two of you can spar with each other? So just don't get too close then. Agree upon a top five. So if you have your shoulder buddy, and I kicked it up to high over the so right? As you're sparring with your partner. And compare your five to their five. Also watch my fingers as they go up in the air. I'm looking for a certain thing, and I'll indicate that I found it with my finger. Okay, go ahead. In order. Um, you said relationships are number one. Um, literacy is number two. Relevance is number three. Class management for the evaluation of that class. Okay. This group. Um, relationships is the first. Relevance is second. Assessment data third. Student centered learning fourth. Class management fifth. Okay. This group. So our goal with rules, procedures, and routines is this. 
we want to start with as few rules as possible when we set three to five, right? And then we want to change rules to procedure and procedure to routine. Rules to procedure, procedure to routine. Harry Wong said that he had one class in his whole career that he taught for 44 years. He had one class in, in his career that ran completely by routine. He didn't have to tell them anything. They had the papers automatically. They did everything automatically. But he said that only happened one time in his entire 44 years. Okay, so thank you for reminding me of that. All right, so where are we at so far? We did this rules, procedure, routine thing. We identified the most effective strategy. <coughs> Next, we're talking about the guiding principle for teaching and learning. And I shared that with you last time we were together. Who remembers? And so do this wedding. What's the guiding principle for everything we'll be doing? Sweat on the bra of the. Huh? Don't remember. Sweat on the bra of the teacher during which process? Plan your teaching and learning. Yeah, we want the teacher to do all the work in planning. So sweat on the bra of the teacher during the planning process. Or you can simply say that we want the teacher to do all the work up front before you get to the classroom. I'll be one word that. Sweat on the bra of the teacher during the planning process. And then sweat on the bra of the student during the teaching and learning process. We want the teacher to turn into the facilitator for learning. Because the person doing the most work in that classroom is the person doing the learning. And we want that to be the student, right? We want the student to be doing the learning in that classroom. So again, question number three is sweat of the broad students during the um, planning sweat of the broad teacher during the planning process, sweat of the broad students during the teaching and learning. So any questions on that kind of question? Next, we're supposed to identify the components of the North Carolina Comprehensive Assessment Process. If you look in your worksheet packet, you'll see a triangle. Someone tell me about that triangle. Look at the triangle and tell me about it. What are, give me one component. One component of the Comprehensive Assessment Process. Form of assessment. Form of assessment is the base of our assessment process. It happens every moment of every day in every classroom in North Carolina. It's the biggest thing we do. It's a function between teacher and student. Nobody else is involved in that process besides teachers and students. It can be as simple as walking around the room and looking over the student's shoulder. It can be asking questions and getting answers back. It can be a ticket out the door. So all those things can be form of assessment. What's the next component? Benchmark yeah, benchmark diagnosis. Diagnostic tests are like I ready. Benchmark assessments can be given by a teacher. So you, you've done some <laughs> teaching and learning, you want to see where the students are, you want to check up, then you give a benchmark assessment. It can be done by a district, so they can see if all sixth grade math teachers are on pace with each other with the pacing guide. Um, and then you can use that data to, to check for interventions to see what type of intervention we need to provide to our students. So that's a benchmark assessment. Let me differentiate for you between formative and benchmark using a homework assignment. Um, so I get homework every day as a teacher. Every, every student, every day, even, even on Christmas break and Thanksgiving break, I gave a homework assignment. So sometimes when the students came back in, I simply walked around and checked for the percentage of completion, like they completed 25% of it, or 50% or 75% or 100. So I gave them a score for trying. What type of score would that be? Four number benchmark. So I gave them a score for trying. Yeah, it'd be four minutes. Because I can't look at my grade book and see level of mastery, right? But I still wanted them to have an incentive to try. So I still gave them a grade. But really, it was just a grade for trying. They sure didn't <laughs> put anything down. Try to differentiate between just going jump down. But anyway, they just stop. But it's the same homework assignment. When they come in, I have the students exchange the paper and I hand out green, green um, pens. I put the solution set up on the board and we grade them. And I put that grade in the grade book. What type of assessment is it now? 
It's a benchmark assessment because I can look in, a, in that grade book and tell level of mastery. It may not be level of mastery as a student. Who else could have done that homework? Now, Tamir could have done the homework, an older brother or sister, a younger brother or sister, someone else or a friend. So other people could have done it, but I'm hoping that the student gives themselves that that's a level of mastery. For sure, when I give tests in the, in the classroom, those are benchmark tests, and I can actually tell them. So I can feel better about their level of mastery. Okay, so you see the difference between formative and benchmark. Some of the assessments, there aren't very many of them. The only ones that you have are EOCs. Um, you use ACTs and SATs here um, in the school. You have some tests for CTE. Those are some assessments. All the teaching and learning has happened. You give a test and you don't go back to that content at all. If you review the content at all before an EOC test, it's no longer a competent, it's then just a benchmark assessment. So all the teaching and learning has happened. You give the test, you don't go back. So it's basically in your school, EOC and those types of assessments. Any questions on those definitions? So we've done that. That's one of these questions on your on your pre-assessment, right? You can answer one of those now in addition to the pick it up and go. All right, the last thing I want to focus on, look at the look at the piece of paper with the bubble. So that's the instructional framework for North Carolina. And your county has decided to um, adopt that as the instructional framework for Hampton County. It has three guiding questions. Give me one of those questions. Yeah, where am I going? And in North Carolina, we have a document. Every teacher has a document that tells you where you're going. What's that document called? It's yes, what? Yeah, it's the North Carolina Standard Course of Study, right? And in your school, the North Carolina Standard Course of Study represents how many minutes of instruction? Not even per class for how many days? Approximately. You lose some. Or approximately 90, right? Because, because you're all your process is close to 8,100 minutes of time, right? So the North Carolina Standard Course of Study represents 8,100 minutes of time. So at the beginning of the year, you have 8,100 minutes of North Carolina Standard Course of Study. At the state level, we break down that North Carolina Standard Course of Study into something called standards. Some standards take 20 days worth of instruction. Some take two or three days. So there's a variety of days that the standard represents, right? It kind of, it's kind of dependent on the students that you have, how fast you can go through a standard. Now say a standard has 20 days worth of instruction. Do all those 20 days have to be consecutive? No, they don't, right? Especially in language arts. Some of those standards happen all through the, all through the semester, right? In math, it's a little bit more sequential. Science is probably a little bit more sequential. But language arts certainly is now. So that's a standard. And then we break it down further into objectives at the state level. But then here at the local level, we have to break it down further into one of those things in the orange circle. What's that first term called? So what? In the green circle. What term do you see? Yeah, a clear learning target. So here's not only one math one teacher grade. That math one teacher is creating those learning targets. Maybe some support if there is someone in the district office to do that, but typically it's that teacher that's creating those learning targets. So we take the 8,100 minutes and break it down into how many learning targets? How many learning targets do we have? How many? Nine yet, right? Because you have semester courses, so you have 90 learning targets. If we put those 90, 90 minute learning targets in order of how we want to teach them, what do you call that guide? A pacing guide, right? In language arts, we call it a curriculum map typically. In math, in science, we typically call it a pacing guide. So that tells us how many minutes we're going to be spending on each learning target. Learning targets add up to be standards, right? So that's all that whole unpacking idea. 90 minutes is still a pretty big amount of time. So if we went into the beginning of a class in math one and said, here's 90 minutes of stuff, I'm going to give you a ticket off the door in a couple seconds, get ready. 
Do you think that would work very well? No. So we take that learning target, which is 90 minutes, and we break it down into a smaller component. And what's the next smaller component called? And then we go. Criteria for success. And criteria for success has a number of minutes also. And it's based on student attention span. Well, what do you think the average student attention span is today? 25. Too big? I heard 15 is still too big? 20 is too big? Huh? 5 to 7 is probably very good. Yeah. My research has got 8. So 5 to 7 is probably very good. Um, and it's probably even lower than that. Because research keeps changing. When I first came into North Carolina, it was 12, and it's dropped to 8 since then. I came into North Carolina in 2000. So it's constantly going down. Um, so, anyway, it's 8 minutes. So, we say we are already losing students at 8 minutes. If we let it go to 16, we lost everybody. So, we kick it back one minute. So, we say 0 to 15. And in elementary school, if you watch pre K or kindergarten, they're changing every 5 minutes or less. So it just depends on the students in front of you and how long they can keep focused on one thing. So, 0 to 15 minute chunks. And we break it down into those 0 to 15 minute chunks we call criteria for success. And um, we break those chunks using a, a variety of things. We can use Bloom's revised taxonomy. So for those chunks, it can be a little bit of knowledge, followed by a little bit of application of that knowledge. Followed by a little bit of rigor, and you rotate through using those kinds of 15 minute chunks. Or you can chunk it by using quantum learning structures. You can use a little bit of um, independent work, followed by a little bit of pair work, followed by a little bit of quads, back to both black to whole group work. So that's another way you can chunk things. So there are a variety of ways of chunking that information and making it interesting for your students, and we'll talk about some of those during our time together. No problem. Any questions on the green bubble? What's another question that we have to answer? Where am I now? How do we know where our students are? Like even before they came into your class for this first semester, how did you know what information could you look at to see where your students were? EBOTS, right? That has some of the data. What else? What's that? Pre-test pre -test you could give, like I gave a pre-test, very good. Do you have access to the student records? So you can, can you look at their grades? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you can go to the student records if you wanted to. You can look at their performance grades um, up to that point. So there are a lot of different sub of uh, grades that you have. Pre-test will give you a little bit of data moving in to see where they're at. So that can answer that question. In addition to that, as you're teaching and learning, you're using a combination of what data again? What are our, what's our um, three different components of the assessment process? We use a lot of formal assessment, and some benchmark assessment, and at the end, some assessment, and that's coming up pretty soon, right? Getting close to the sum of assessment. That's that whole teaching and learning process. What's another question we need to know? Yeah, so how do we close the gap between where our students are when they enter our classroom today and where we want them to be at the end of the period? How often does a teacher, or how often should a teacher ask that question in a 90 minute block? How do I close the gap from where <coughs> students are right this, month, this moment of time to where I want them to be the next moment of time? How often should a teacher ask that question? Often. Every time you transition, so every 0 to 15 minutes, she said. Any other answer? How often should you ask the question, how do I close the gap from where my students are at this moment of time to where I want them to be the next moment of time? Every moment, right? The definition, remember, of a form of assessment, you ask that question every moment of every day. Because you're constantly trying to move your students forward. In addition, I heard a group talking about not having students practice incorrectly. You want to make sure that you're constantly listening to the students, watching what they're doing, to ensure they're not practicing incorrectly, right? 
Because if you do allow them to practice incorrectly, <coughs> then you have to unteach it and reteach it, which loses the whole day of instruction. So if you can catch them right away as they're doing it right, you say, Whoa, keep doing it right. In fact, help some other people. But if they're doing it incorrectly, you want to catch it as quickly as you possibly can using the form of assessment data to put them back on track. You give them descriptive feedback, you say, This is what you're doing right, this is what's not quite right, and this is how you can get back on track. Any questions with that whole piece of the very topic? That's pretty much what we'll be talking about um, for the rest of our time together um, in the next seven sessions. We'll be reviewing this over and over and over again. Let's go back to the tick out the door to make sure everybody's ready. I didn't have a one of the ten hundred percent in my first room, which is disappointing. So let's make sure everyone knows the three questions that are going to be on that out the door. So question number one is has to do with rules, procedures, and routines. Toby, tell me about rules. Right. So the only thing you have to write out is, is consequence could lead to the outcome. So if you write that, you regret. So all the other stuff you said is that too. But have a consequence that could lead to the outcome. Um, procedures. Oscar, tell me about procedures. But what do we still have to do to the student with a procedure as compared to a routine? You're still reminding them. You're giving them direction. So you're still reminding them. It's not automatic yet. So let's see. So, so Misha, tell me about routine. Right. All you have to do is write the word automatic. If you do that, you'll be fine for those three terms. And then our, our goal is to change rules to and procedures to routine. Here, you want to have everything happen automatically. So everything is. The more things happen automatically, the more time you'll have to instruct. Any questions on question number one on your tick out the door? So you're not writing yet. We're just going over. Question number two has to do with yes. the guy in principle, what is it? Sweat, right? Can we use sweat? Dashing? Correct. And that's half of it. During teaching and learning. One of the problems was teacher during the planning process. One of the problems was student during the that day long. One of the problems was teacher during the planning process. One of the problems was student during the teaching and learning process. That's question number two. Sweat on the problem was teacher during the planning process. And sweat on the problem was student during the teaching and learning process. The board in the classroom, you can say. In the classroom. You don't have to put your own words. You can put it on your own board. So that comes from research. Question number three, the components of the schedule two. That's it. What? That's my three question, right? No, you skipped two. I skipped number two. What is it? Relationship. Relationship. Build them up. Question number two is relationship, right? Relationship is the key. So just put that one more down and get that. Any any other questions for me? Okay, take out the door, make sure your name's on it, hand in hand, and we're done. Have a great rest of your day.